Got it. So, um, very warm welcome to everybody for the 10th meeting of Soteria, where I shall be talking about the French writer who died last year, Jean Raspail. And I should like to start with um, directly with a quotation, perhaps his most famous quotation from one of his books. And if we have any French reader, uh, or any French language reader, then I don't think we do, unfortunately. Um, perhaps I shall read, unless somebody else feels very confident about their French, uh, the French oh, passage. I think uh, Michael put his hand. I mean, Michael has a Michael, place in yeah, the south of France, so that's good. Absolutely, then fine. It's, uh, um, I'll I share won't the screen, say even what it is. Uh, just, yeah, fine. Uh, can everyone see that? No. Nope. Whether we can understand it doesn't know the matter. Ah, oh, I mean, um, the, the um, English translation follows. Uh, yeah. Right. So, Ma Michael, would you like to to read the um, French? Uh, Michael in London. Sorry, what is this from? Is this from a book? Yeah. Yeah, it will explain itself. Perhaps if right. we have just just the people who read the texts and okay. making comments, we can talk about it at the end. Set right. cavalier uh, qui terre la ville au prépa school, passe au soleil couchant par la porte de l'ouest, qui n'était plus gardé. Quel autre sans se cacher au contraire de tous ceux qui avant avaient abandonné la ville? Car il ne fuyait pas, il ne trahissait rien, espérant moi encore et se garder d'imaginer. Ainsi était-il était armé le cœur et l'âme des encombrés scintillant froidement comme du cristal pour le voyage qui les entendait. Sur l'ordre de Margrave héréditaire simplement, il allait, il s'était mis en mouvement et le plus jeune d'entre eux, qui n'avait pas six ans, fait donner une ch chanson. <laughs> OK, I'll um, give you the English translation. Seven horsemen were leaving the city at dusk, facing the setting sun by the west gate, which was no longer guarded. Heads held high and without concealing themselves, for unlike all those who had abandoned the city, they were not fleeing, they were not betraying anything, still less were they hoping, and they did not presume to imagine. They were armed for the voyage which awaited them, and their unencumbered hearts shone with cold brilliance like crystal. It was just out of obedience to the orders of the hereditary. Sid? Oh, sorry, I've, I've just reading, yes, reading the uh, French. Hereditary Margrave so. that they had swung into movement, and the youngest of them, not yet 16 years old, was humming a song. Camp des Saints, the Camp of the Saints, is Jean Raspail's best known work. But the lines of that opening paragraph to his novel, Set Cavalier, Seven Horsemen, are probably the most quoted and the best known. Mm -hmm. Raspail's novels abound with fantasy, symbol, and prophecy. Jean Raspail died at the age of 96 on June the 13th, 2020. Tributes poured in. Former European MP and co-founder of the European identity movement, Iliad, uh, Jean-Yves Gallou stated that Raspail was, quote, the man who foretold the destructive impact of blame culture and anti-racism on our civilization way back in 1973. Marine Le Pen tweeted, Jean Raspail has left us an immense loss for the national family. Le Con des Saints should be read and reread. Apart from its skilled depiction of the dangers of migration, it pitilessly portrays the submitted submissiveness of our elites. Adored by some, cursed by others, 
wrote Michel Nolin, Le Figaro on the 16th of June, 2020, referring to Raspail as a royalist ecologist and noting that his world has left its mark on French literature. He continued, Raspail wrote as a means of escape, a defender of lost causes. He published Qui se souvient des hommes, recalling men in 1986 after spending time among the last of the Alakulafs, a people living at the tip of Tierra del Fuego and facing extinction. With its power, its obstinacy, Raspail's works are still very seductive and new readers come to him with each generation, but his writing is also divisive. Jean Raspail was born into a well-to-do family on the 5th of July, 1925, in the small town of chemillet sur dome in the department of Indre et le Loire in the Loire Valley. His father, Octave Raspail, was president of a large flour mill near Paris, which is still in operation, and director general of the Saar mines. Raspail attended the Roman Catholic Lycée Saint-Jean de Passé in the wealthy 16th arrondissement of Paris, and one of his teachers was the writer Marcel Johandot. Raspail subsequently attended l'Institution Saint-Marie and lastly the prestigious École de Roche in Normandy. An experience while he was still in the Scouts made a deep impression upon him, a voyage by canoe across the rivers and lakes of Canada and the United States. Mm -hmm. Raspail was a copious travel writer as well as a novelist with some 40 titles to his name. The plots of his novels vary, but certain themes recur and act as signposts to an idiosyncratic singular vision of the world, a vision not without paradox and contradiction. Given his religious faith, his anti-democratic views and dislike of a good deal of what is called progress, it may surprise that Raspai did not occur, incur more opprobrium than he did. Perhaps it was a certain aura of purity, almost saintliness about him which disarmed many potential critics. His eccentricity, evidently endearing too, the genuineness of his loyalty to suffering and lost causes is indisputable. The same can be said of his insistence on the primordial importance of cultural and ethnic identity. Eschewing polemics, Raspail was not a good public speaker and party politics, he promoted his beliefs mostly through his fiction and travel accounts, but also by creating publicity stunts. On June the 1st, 1984, he led an invasion of the tiny Minkie Islands, which belong to the Channel Islands, and lie between Jersey and San Malo. In retaliation, he claimed for the recapture of the Falklands Malvinas by the oh. British. However, unlike nearly all those who opposed the British claim to the Falklands, Raspail did not wish to see them annexed by Argentina. He claimed that they belonged neither to Britain nor to Argentina, but to the Kingdom of Patagonia, of which he declared himself to be honorary council general. At the time of the Falklands War, a hitherto unknown Council of Patagonia released a statement sent to the Agence France Presse and also delivered to British and um, Argentinian embassies in France. And the first lines of the declaration read. You got it there? If somebody yeah. would like to read yeah. the declaration? Um, uh, Robin, do you want to read, would you like to read it? <laughs> the government of his of his majesty Aurelie Antoine, the first king of Patagonia, meeting in extraordinary council in Puerto Hombre in the Strait of Magellan has examined the situation in the Malvinas Islands with the most rigorous attention and wishes to remind England and Argentina that they have no claim to the slightest sovereignty over islands that constitute part of the national territory of the Kingdom of Patagonia. Consequently, His Majesty's government orders the English and Argentine fleets to withdraw from the territorial waters of Patagonia within 15 days. Thank you. The events caused some commotion and publicity. In North and South America, Raspai was an impassioned defender of the indigenous peoples. Among the tribes for whom Raspai spoke were the Mayapush Indians, a tribe living in Chile and Argentina within the boundaries of Patagonia. And here is a very short clip 
on the Mapuche Indians. Right. Um, no, hang on. I'll, I'll just have to do the. So I've got the share. Mm -hmm. Share shout sounds right. Let's go. Chile. It's that narrow strip of land running down South America's southwest coast, bordering the Pacific Ocean for more than 4,000 kilometers. Beyond the jagged rocky cliffs lies a fertile land. Animals graze on the volcanic earth and agriculture here is a way of life. This is where Chile's natives, the Mapuche Indians, live, isolated in tiny villages. Irena is a farmer. She lives in a ruka in her farmyard. These typical houses are made from wood, clay and reeds. They're windowless, have an open fire in the middle and east-facing doors. There are no floorboards since the Mapuche don't want anything separating them from the soil. Here is a mother figure to them. It's no coincidence then that Mapuche means people of the land. Tradition is exceedingly important to Elena, but her life too has changed in recent decades. But today is different because ya la Everything is totally different today. It's also modern. We have electric lights and washing machines, but we still have our own customs, traditions and language. Unfortunately, today's children are no longer learning our language. The parents are partially to blame, but so is society. Hay dos culpables, uno somos nosotros y otro es la sociedad. Irena and her husband René can still understand the Mapuche language, Mapudungun. René returns with his team of oxen from woodcutting. Summer will soon be over and Chilean winters can be harsh. The division of responsibilities here follows very traditional lines. René Weche works out in the forest with his oxen, while his wife looks after their home, farmyard and general well-being. There's flatbread to eat and, above all, yerba mate, a sweetened mate tea to drink. This traditional herbal infusion is drunk through a metal straw, the bombilla. This is mate. It has a lovely herbal taste and gives us strength. Bueno, yo creo que el mate es el momento para la conversación, el momento para estar juntos un rato, porque si se tomaba una taza de té, se lo tomó y, y salió. En cambio, el mate son, no es un mate, sino que son 10 mate, 11 mate, entonces estar todo el rato juntos. Mate makes sure everything is running smooth, body, soul, and perhaps even marriage. The lives of the Mapuche Indians are simple and traditional. They are indeed the people of the land. I think that uh, shows, thank you for that, um, perfectly um, the attachment that Jean Raspai had to peoples across the globe who themselves were threatened by globalism. And uh, that's a very important part, I think, of Raspai's worldview. Patagonia, well, what is this Patagonia? It's a, a land of dreams, of course, a lost domain. It's comparable to Drio La Rochelle's Bolivia in Loma Chaval, or the idealized Middle Ages of Hermann Hesse's Narcissus and Goldman, or the Illyria of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. These are fantasy realms beyond lived experience, remaining somewhere between our lived reality and our dreams, a country or a time which might exist if there were a slight adjustment in the world. The kingdom of Patagonia then is Raspai's idealized South America, the land that is and never was, a utopia in stark contrast to the dystopia of his novel about third world immigration, Le Conde des Saints. His part fictional, part historical, part biographical prize-winning Moi Antoine de Tourne, Roi de Patagonie, which was later filmed for television and starred Omar Sharif, describes the doomed attempts by the 19th century French adventurer Antoine de Tounen to unite Indian tribes 
under the banner of an independent Patagonia. It is characteristic of Raspai's fictional writing that he interweaves his narrative with historical events and characters so that it is sometimes difficult to make out where history ends and fiction begins. There was indeed a King Aurel Antoine I whose tomb is in Perigord and who reigned for 28 years over Patagonia, unsuccessfully hoping for French, French protection of the exploited tribes. Needless to say, neither Chile nor Argentina have ever showed the least sympathy for the cause of a nation called Patagonia. Here is the scene from the televised film uh, where King Aurelia Antoine I appeals vainly, as it turns out in this scene, to his adopted subjects to unite under the banner of Patagonia. This is from the French television film of Jean Raspail's book. Celui que t'appelles ton peuple. Il est beau. Ce que tu ne sais pas, Baral, c'est que la beauté naît de la liberté. Et c'est sa liberté que mon peuple défend. Quant à eux. À Villa Rica. Regardez-moi ça, je vous l'avais dit, bougre de bougre, fou allié. Écoute-moi, il faut pas qu'on reste ici. Qu'est-ce que tu crois que je fais Mais ils vont nous massacrer Il loue un mec, il y a un terrain à les bouts. Traverser la terre pour vous retrouver. Votre lutte pour l'indépendance 
C'est connu du monde entier La nouvelle en a fait le tour avant de m'atteindre tel un signe, un appel, une prière. Me voici Vous, les fils valeureux de vos chefs martyrs, Laotaro, Kaopolikan, après trois siècles de lutte, vous pouvez enfin vous tourner vers un autre prince. Moi, divisé, vous êtes faible. Unis, vous êtes invincible. Et votre union, votre drapeau, votre lien, votre ciment, en toute humilité, je vous le redis, c'est moi. Mapuches, je vous appelle. Tehuelches, je vous appelle. Puelches, je vous appelle. Willyches, je vous appelle. Unissez-vous sous ma bannière. Le sabre royal vous conduira à la victoire. Unissez-vous et suivez-moi. Tu as fini chez toi, Michael. Yeah, he's moving. Let's just. Had a slightly surreal quality with that slow moving. Uh, I don't know what happened with the YouTube. They were a bit slow moving. Um, slightly surreal as well because of, in French with Spanish subtitles. But um, I think it was clear enough what yeah. was uh, happening in the symbolic of that and a really beautiful scene. I think. Yeah. And um, yeah. This is what happens to many dreams and lost causes, I think. Is, is that uh, representative of his, his life, perhaps? I don't know. Uh, possibly. Many of Raspai's works bear witness to his devotion to monarchy, along with his rejection and loathing of the French Revolution and everything it stood for. Notably, as he saw it, parliamentary democracy, disrespect for racial difference and egalitarianism. Raspai's novel, Seer, published in 1976, recounts the crowning of a French king. Philippe Charles François Louis Henri Jean Robert Hugues Faramond de Bourbon in Reims Cathedral on the 3rd of February 1999. In his preface, Raspai dispenses with the customary usage you know, this has nothing to do with any living character. The customary usage of what he calls certain facetious or cautious writers to include the customary wa waiver that any resemblance to any person living or dead is purely coincidental. He admits to no such waiver and agrees that it could not be applied to Sire, although the heir to the throne and hero of the novel is indeed fictional. He writes in his preface, the young Prince Philip Faramond de Bourbon, the hero of this book, does not exist, but he could exist. In this account of what could happen, a group of loyal subjects ensure that after 175 years, a French king is again crowned in Reims Cathedral, anointed with the precious chrism with which all the kings of France were anointed, and of which a small quantity has been saved from destruction by the sans-culotte. In Raspai's tale, the once and future king is stalked by the Minister of the Interior, a devoted democratic politician. Democratic in Raspai's novels is always negative. A devoted democratic politician, which condemns him in Raspai's eyes. A man called Pierre Rotz. Rotz, incidentally, means snot in German. I do not know if Raspai knew that, but given his liking for symbol and the power of names and his knowledge of languages, I consider it very likely that he did. Rotz becomes obsessed with what should be a minor case, the case relating to a rumor of a plot to crown a prince of the ancient and royal house of Bourbon, again, King of France and anoint him with the royal chrism in Rand Cathedral. But what should be a matter of minor importance to the establishment makes the president uneasy and obsesses Rotz. In one scene, Raspai describes how Rotz is touched by a beneficent force. 
Rotz's temptation is an example of Raspai's humor and mischievousness. Of course, Christian writing traditionally examines or considers the saint tempted by maleficent thoughts or a tempter. Here we have the bad man tempted by a good force. The dots in this reading are because the reading's too long, so I've, uh, my translation. And oh, the dot, 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 which I've used not to use an expletive is uh, because Raspai didn't use the full expletive himself. So I'm following the author in that respect. Um, Michael, who would you like to read this? Uh... Oh, well, um, who feels that they would like to read? Uh, perhaps, I don't mind, absolutely oh. anyone. Um, Danielle, or perhaps you'd, you'd like to have a go? Yeah. Um, if you don't have technical problems, Daniel, because I know you yeah. don't. Uh, I have only problems in listening, not um, in reading. <laughs> okay. Um, Pierre Roth was still contemplate, contemplating the silence of his office in Place Beauvau. He was trembling, just a slight contraction of the heart. For the second time in the day, or in the maze of his unconscious mind, a secret. Letting in a kind of new sympathy in fl to flow in, in palpable, rapidly pattering hours, something akin to new sound, difficult to perceive lucidly, astonishing for a man who had always been quite insensible, something which he realized with alarm was sustainable land. No, not me, he cried out loud, furious with himself. He was overworking and had been doing so for years, hardly sleeping, his mind always on the watch. In the long run, there um, <laughs> in the long run there could always be failure. No, he discarded that explanation. Exercise in power had never tired him. Twice the reverse. He never felt better than when he was Lead to his death in the center of his left. Different members of the government waiting anxiously for a call from him. Tens of thousands, thousands of people at his back in court, laying threats for friends and so, with same malevolent energy. Was he getting ill? <clears throat> Political vampires do not wait. Every victim gave him a new, gave him new life. You cannot get rid of enemies other than the, by beating them, and, and that wouldn't be happening to him any day soon. So, what about his power month? What he had been feeling had, had been surprising him all day long. This importance, which he himself brought, the only potent minister of the interior, Accorded to a youth who stood for nothing, who represents no one, not even the memory of a people who had long ago lost him. Fishing out Philip's picture out of his shoulder, he placed it on the desk in front of him. You don't impress me, he mourned. He knew that wasn't true, but this time at least he didn't lower his eyes when this when he met those of the young men in the picture, but to his amazement, they seemed to deafen him. The thought of Blair which went out as soon as it had, had gone, leaving him with his amazement. He's beginning to... Oh, see me <laughs> off. You can feel that as well. <laughs> to piss me off, he said to himself. As I say, show us by thank you, left that. It was Dots himself, so I wish to respect the wishes of the writer in that uh, respect. And it is true, actually, by the way, that Raspai avoided, even in his most violent novels, uh, expletives. As far as I can remember, I, there's no expletive in his book, any of his books that I've read. Raspai was not prepared to change or adapt views or attitudes of centuries to give way to progress or to keep abreast of the times. He was heroically, nobly, and yes, at times, I think intentionally comically, for puckishness is a feature of his writing and character, out of step with the march of the modern age. 
He believed in hierarchy as the world insisted ever more shrilly that everyone is equal. He believed in privilege when entitlement is the slogan of our times. He held fast to centuries old traditions and custom when you cannot stop progress has become a cliche. He was loyal to the kingdom of France when almost the entire French political landscape, including the Front National, accepts the achievements of the revolution as a fact, which it is only realistic to accept. He believed in authority when ruled by the people and the voter knows best are venerated items of the democratic codex from left to right. He upheld style and maintained reserve when letting your feelings all hang out is everywhere celebrated, admired and abetted. Nevertheless, and paradoxically, Raspail was admired and well known for his books and he was a popular man. He became a successful writer and quoted traveler without compromising the views he held. His novels are, at least superficially, pessimistic, pervaded with melancholy and regret, and frequently a sense of foreboding and doom. Many end in betrayal and failure. Failure? Whether one fails or succeeds is less important to Raspail than how one fails or succeeds, with dignity and integrity, or with no dignity and ignobly. The wisdom of our times tells us that everything hinges on whether an individual is successful, how or in what one succeeds being of secondary consideration. For a spy, the reverse is true. Like the martyrs of days of old, whom he temperamentally resembles, what is important in life for a spy is not success or failure in themselves, but the manner of success and the manner of failure and of greater importance still than either success or failure is fidelity. Fidelity, even if the expression seems sentimental, to one's own soul. The heroes of Raspail's novels are not those who triumph in the material world, but those who triumph over themselves, who maintain their dignity, who keep alight a beacon of hope, they are contrasted with those who abandon any of the three life-sustaining and divine virtues, faith, hope, and love. A word with very negative connotations in Raspail's world is realistic, which reminds me of a book by A.K. Chesterton written many years ago called The New Unhappy Lords, in which he expressed the view that realism or realistic was the word, was the word that he most hated in the English language. Realistic because for a spy, it is cowardly and in an insistent voice of realism that destroys faith, destroys hope and destroys love. He had a relativist approach to different races and cultures, which runs counter to the widely touted interpretation of the word racist. Uh, in the sense that he was aware of racial and cultural differences, Raspai was indeed every inch a racist but in the sense that his writings bear witness to an intense sympathy for the less technically advanced races, for all peoples doomed by technical progress to integration or extermination, Raspai, to coin a modern expression, did not have a racist bone in his body. His sympathy is clear in his harrowing, tragic and grimly realistic account of the decline of the Alakulovs the subject of his grim and strangely titled novel, Qui se souvient des hommes, Remembering Men. In his account, Raspail discounts the myth of the Red Indian or Native American as the innocent indigenous victim of the white invader. So-called Native Americans, we read in this book, were Asian invaders who drove the Alakov mercilessly out of North and South America, leaving that wretched people to their own devices when they were cornered amid the inhospitable rocks of the extreme south. Kisa Souvient des Hommes is a statement of sympathy for the Alakulov underdog, for a race with a primitive religion, a primitive language with a tiny vocabulary, next to no grammar, no technical achievements more advanced than those of the Neanderthal. Everything is in the gesture, the beauty of an illusion, loyalty to people, loyalty to a land, to a code. Raspail uh, describes his highly autobiographical novel, L'Ile Bleu, The Blue Island, uh, in the following way. 
which I'll read in a minute, or we'll read. Um, one, one comment on that, the expression used, there is nothing to a novel but truth, in French, il n'y a de roman que de vérité, is coining an expression made by Nathalie Sarrault in an interview in the 1950s, talking on the secondary role of plot in the so-called roman nouveau, the new novel, that there is nothing to the novel but the human being. And I think this strangely almost, in citation marks, left aspect of Raspail is overlooked. His uh, merging of the quite open merging of the biographical, uh, the lived experience and the importance of experience with the fictional. Mm -hmm. So here we come to the introduction or the early part of his book, Leo Bleu. So, um, Edith, to read that. Um, Edith, would you like to read that? Are you still there? Yeah, rather. He's mute for one thing. He's muted. Ah. Oh. Okay, uh, first I should say that this book uh, is about, it relates to the occupation of France and Raspail's experience of the occupation of France. Uh, he was 14 years old. Leaving childhood into adulthood is the process of passing through a wall, something you manage more or less skillfully. The head passes through the wall and there is a totally different landscape and you pass on through because there's no way back. Some cope better than others. Some cope very badly and hurt themselves. Some can almost die in the process, literally or figuratively. In our special case, we passed into adolescence by plunging straight into a real war. We found ourselves playing a game that suddenly became real. On the Blue Island, we were our twin sovereigns the very proud Bertrand and the very beautiful Mitty. Then there was Pierrot, Zygomar, Zazan, and lastly, the narrator, who might also be the author of this book, for there is nothing to a novel but the truth. The Blue Island, our magic kingdom, a small island between two arms of the river in the depths of Touraine. The kingdom was caught up in the torment of June 1940, the defeat of the French armed forces, the invasion, the collapse of the country, up to the day when a young German officer, 20 years old, arrives before the island. Phantasms in the wind, love, honour, pride, the tribe, the clan, the kingdom, the mystery of life, of death, the insolence of soul and heart, the theatre of grand emotions, physical devotion, beauty, dreams shedded to pieces, reality. That is how we were, adolescents of that time, adolescents of all time. That is how we wanted to be, at least we thought so. Thank God that until the end of the world, adolescence will ever be a time of illusions. Well, thank you very much. That was beautifully read and beautiful piece of writing. Yeah, yeah. Mm, stunning. There is humour and pathos in Raspail's self-deprecatory description of himself in Lille Bleu, which relates events in the depths of the French countryside in 1940, when Raspail was himself 14 years old. He and his friends are too young to join the army, but old enough to feel the shame of France's defeat. They belong to a gang led by the charismatic Bertrand Carré, a figure reminiscent of Alain Fournier's Grand Meun. Bertrand is determined to organize resistance himself. In the remote part of France where his gang lives, he prepares a military ambush for the first German tanks when they cross over to the Blue Island. Bertrand organizes his group of subordinates to lay a trap for the approaching Germans. The strongly biographical narrator is a cowardly wretch who knows he will never have Bertrand's courage. He is near to paralyzed with self-pity and terror when he realizes that Bertrand is deadly serious about his plan to attack German tanks. So in a state of abject funk, Raspai, or sorry, the narrator, prays, and prayer is the expression of hope, even for somebody as cowardly as the narrator. And here is, I would say, Raspai making fun of his own cowardice. Uh, Mick, uh, I think you're the only one that hasn't read. Would you like to read this if you're still there? Um, yeah. Yeah, okay.
I remained for a long time in the darkness, my eyes opened, listening to the noises of the night. I divided up my prayers. God saved me from Bertrand, the Germans, from girls, from myself. I was frightened, frightened of being frightened, frightened of showing that I was frightened, frightening to agree to follow Bertrand because I knew. So I lost, I lost the place now. I, I knew that. that oh, that, so that I knew that at the moment I agreed I would be frightened, frightened to refuse because I was frightened. Fear battered on my temples and my heart like the gigantic waves of a hurricane. Outside, the wind was high. A branch fell from a tree, making a noise like a detonation. Then in order not to break down altogether, I had no alternative but to recite the coward's prayer. I recited with relish, hands joined. I had made it up myself. Retrieving the words of a litany and pushing out unedited parts which crept in each time I said the prayer, kept me occupied. Of God pity the cowards, because they are the most miserable of all. Oh God, have pity on poltroons, etc. The frightened, the wet, the scared, the runaways, the terrified, the deserters, the funkers, the yellow bellies, the deflated, the hideaways. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The only access to the Blue Island is over, over a bridge, is blocked on Bertrand's instructions with a barrier. The barrier consists of, quote, trunks of three felled poplar trees, which serves as the anti-tank emplacement supported by two pairs of posts fixed into the ground and somewhat loose. Respy arrives, or sorry, the narrator. The narrator arrives at the military post, which Bertrand has set up, guarded by Sigomar, a member of the, quote, battalion. Bertrand, the reader learns, is not defending the Blue Island with a Republican tricolor, for we remember that Respy is not in favor of the French flag. Something else is hanging. Oh, one more reading. Uh, well, Robin, would you like to uh, give this a go? <clears throat> What's that? We are both ahead higher than the barrier. That, he said with a determined voice, is an anti-tank installation. We had never seen an anti-tank installation, but we knew of them, but what, we knew, a, what of them we knew of them yeah. was not very different from the thing which Bertrand had constructed on the Blue Island. In this respect, the French army labored under the same delusions as we did. This huge barrier could not be breached. Superb, I declared, and what's that? I did not recognize the homemade flag which drooped down as there was no wind attached to a hazel wood flagpole roped to the top of the barrier. During our games on the Blue Island, we usually chose the blue and red banner of the Cross of St. Andrew of the Confederate Army, which went well with our caps and came out of our usual general supply of materials. This flag was made of blue, white and green horizontal stripes. It was Bertrand's idea, said Sigomar. You have to salute it. What am I saluting? I don't know. Shall I carry on? And elaborate? No, that's fine. That's, thank you okay. very much. That's the, yeah. An elaborate tripwire to detonate fireworks at various distances is carefully set up to make the invading Germans think that they have encountered armed resistance from a sizable military force. Bertrand's group have summoned up teenage reinforcements consisting of, quote, eight would-be soldiers equipped with quarterstaffs topped with old caps, the soldiers wearing helmets from the 1914-18 war, and carrying antique hunting rifles for arms and they maintain guard on the northern front of the island. Bertrand has created his own flag, which he expects his comrades to salute because he believes the French flag has disgraced itself. The German tanks do come to the island and Bertrand is killed, a boy who is respected by the German tank commander for his courage. After the war, a plaque is erected on the order of Bertrand's fatal word in Raspai, democratic cousin which shows the mendacious nature of public life in the post-war French Republic. And the plaque reads, Here fell Bertrand Carré, the first member of the resistance in Touraine. He died for France at the age of 14 years, assassinated by the Nazis on the 21st of June, 1940. The narrator comments Riley, with the exception of the name, the age and the date, not a word of that was true. And thus ends Lille Bleu. 
After a canoeing expedition from Quebec to New Orleans, Raspais uh, led a motor trip from La Tierra de Fuego to Alaska from the 25th of September 1951 to the 8th of May 1952, a trek more hazardous then than today. That led to the publication of his first book in 1952, an account of his voyage, Tierre du Feu, Alaska. In 1954, he led a French exploration to find remains of the Incan Empire in Peru. He also spent a year in Japan in 1956, memories of which inspired his first novel, published in 1958, Le Vent des Pins, The Wind of the Pines. Strange that, the wind of the pines, not the wind in the pines. Mm. Raspail was reactionary in the true original sense of the word reactionary, meaning he was consciously reacting to the slogans and ambitions of the French Revolution and to the secular globalist and egalitarian creeds which are indebted to France. He believed in the divinely given right of French monarchs to incorporate France. He regarded all democratic politicians without exception as usurpers. He did not acknowledge the tricolor as the French flag. This is typical of the uncompromising rejection of the progressive French Republic and from the modern world and most marks of progress in general. Although it should be said, he was fond of fast yachts and elegant vintage cars as revealed in his romantic novel, Les Yeux d'Irene, Irene's Eyes, the principal theme of which is the angelic and diabolic force within the eternal feminine. Modern architecture, motorways, and the mobs of the democratic world are depicted by the author with a revulsion close to horror in Les Yeux d'Irene. In 1992, Raspail founded Le Comité pour la Commémoration de la Mort de Louis XVI, the Committee in Commemoration of the Death of Louis XVI, which on the 21st of January 1993 held a rally at the Place de la Concorde in homage to the man Raspail always referred to as the Martyr King. <coughs> Louis guillotined on the same spot two centuries before. Sorry. Raspail was not a lonely crank, however, crying unheeded in the wilderness. His writings and his actions resonated. According to Karl Heinz Weissmann, writing in the German weekly paper Junge Freiheit, 60,000 people, including the American ambassador, Walter Curley, answered Raspail's call to honor France's martyred king. Amen. Someone wrote that Jean Raspail had France in his blood. It is true that he felt bound to his country by ties of blood, of religion, and not least language. Despite or because of these positions, Jean Raspail showed profound respect for other nations and cultures, did not judge them from the position of a superior Christian, Westerner, white man, liberal, progressive, socialist, man of the enlightenment, democrat, promoter of European values, or any other system which preaches moral amelioration while quietly advancing its own ends. This sage, knowledgeable and paradoxically tolerant man recognized and admired different nations and cultures as works of God in much the same way as one may admire the diversity of natural life as proof of the wonders of divine creation. While Raspail was tolerant of human differences, especially group differences, he was disdainful of surrender in the face of whatever poses an existential threat to that identity. Evil is a very real force in Raspail's novels. It is characterized by a lust to overthrow ceremony, custom, tradition and respect. It is the spirit of disharmony. It rages against and assaults and violates beauty, hierarchy, control and distance. Evil in Raspail's works is characterized by a dissolution of the sacred and adherence to and subservience to the profane and the base. The opposite of man as a being attempting to mirror the divine through the symbols of his culture is the being abandoned to the compulsion of the telluric act committed without aspiration beyond the uncontrolled blind impulse of time present. Evil is the force which seeks to spoil, destroy, shred, pull down, dismember, overturn, and destroy distances and deny time and specifically deny the past. In his majestic and disturbing novel, Set Cavalier, Seven Horse Riders, beautifully captured for comic strip editions of the work by the artist and friend of Raspail's, Jacques Terpon, 
The reader is taken to a city which is not quite real in a country which is close to reality, but again, not quite real. Once prosperous and happy, the people have become overcome by a strange, inscrutable cynicism, a destructive instinct, a nihilism, an inexplicable impulse of resentment against all which is spiritual and traditional has crept inscrutably into the city and penetrated the hearts of men and women, and most especially and horribly of the children. When the novel opens, most of the city's inhabitants have fled. A gray, intangible, despoiling force, readers might be reminded of Lovecraft here, has overtaken a once prosperous city. Seven riders leave the city to seek, to seek what? Answers, assistance, at least to seek an alternative in the world beyond the city walls. I, I was surprised when I was preparing this talk that there's so little to see of Turpin's walk, uh, work on the internet of his, his uh, book versions of Les Sept Cavaliers that might have to do with copyright. Um, I do not myself own the three picture books which depict Les Sept Cavaliers. Uh, my birthday is on November the 1st, so if anybody's <laughs> thinking of sending me a birthday <laughs> present, there's a big hint. Um, I did find this clip, uh, which is in French, uh, provides a view of some of Terpon's work and we can see Terpon Raspai himself. It has rather cheesy music accompanying it and a very gushing presenter and it's hardly in tune with the atmosphere of the book or the artists. But on the other hand, it does underline the fact that Raspai was regarded with remarkable benevolence in the contemporary world, because this is from, as far as I remember, this is from mainline mainstream French television, uh, introducing the cartoon version of Set, of Set Cavalier by Terpon, yeah, to the television viewer. Right. Cette semaine, la... Cette semaine, la culturelle vous propose un voyage imaginaire. C'est aux éditions Delcourt, l'un des temples de la bande dessinée, que nous avons pris rendez-vous avec les auteurs des Sept Cavaliers. Jean, je voulais savoir tout d'abord si vous estimiez que les dessins de Jacques Terpent sont fidèles à l'univers que vous aviez imaginé dans votre roman. Au début, j'étais réticent et quand on m'a montré les cinq ou six premières planches de, de Jacques Terpent, euh, j'ai dit « je suis chez moi, je suis dans le livre ». Et ça m'a même euh, beaucoup surpris. Et euh, il, il, il s'est... Il s'est enfilé dans ce, dans ce roman comme s'il était un autre moi-même. Vous avez vécu de belles aventures. Est-ce que certaines vous ont amené à être à cheval Autrefois, oui, au Pérou notamment, euh, euh, près du lac Titicaca, Machu Picchu, à 4300 mètres d'altitude. Mais ça, il y a plus de 55 ans. Et j'ai passé des heures et des heures sur, sur la selle. Mais je ne peux pas appeler ça monter à cheval. Je peux me déplacer à cheval. Mais j'en je, garde quand même des, des souvenirs étonnants, je vous assure, de ce temps-là ces grandes cavalcades partout dans ces pays déserts. Et quand vous avez écrit cette histoire des sept cavaliers, vous étiez l'un des sept cavaliers peut-être Le titre c'est sept cavaliers, alors euh, je peux en effet me considérer comme le huitième. Quelquefois je dis que je suis le trompette du, du régiment. Jacques, parlez-nous de cette histoire, Les Sept Cavaliers, et surtout pourquoi avoir choisi d'adapter ce roman particulièrement de Jean Raspail qui s'intitulait Les Sept Cavaliers qui perdent la ville. Parce que je suis un lecteur de Jean Raspail, je connaissais ce roman depuis longtemps, et c'est l'histoire d'une principauté imaginaire dans un, aux confins d'une Europe à la fois réaliste mais en même temps imaginaire. Sept Cavaliers qui est une ville où tout est en déliquescence, qui est dirigée par un margrave héréditaire qui a perdu pied. Il lui reste sept chevaux dans ses écuries. Il va confier à sept cavaliers la mission d'aller voir au-delà ce qui se passe et de comprendre. Le titre parle de lui-même, sept cavaliers. Est-ce que vous êtes cavalier vous-même ou est-ce que vous avez une certaine proximité avec le cheval Oui, j'ai une proximité avec le cheval. Ma fille Garance est très, très cavalière. Elle fait de l'endurance sur, euh, sur des barbarabes qui sont à la maison. Je suis, moi, plus palefrenier que cavalier parce que... Bon, on connaît l'inconvénient du cheval, donc c'est voilà, j'ai plus cette fonction-là, mais c'est vrai que j'ai une proximité avec le cheval et, et c'est un animal qui me séduit beaucoup. Ça vous a fait plaisir quelque part de le dessiner dans cette œuvre qui... Ça m'a fait plaisir, mais en même temps c'est très difficile.
Les deux premiers albums de la trilogie des Sept Cavaliers, parus aux éditions Delcourt, viennent de sortir en librairie. Retrouvez toutes les informations sur l'émission sur la culturelle.fr, bien sûr. Bonne lecture à vous et à la semaine prochaine. Ciao. Yeah, there we are. So that was from La Couturelle, and it was 2016, I saw, and still this uh, ability of Jean Raspail, which is, I would say, almost unique, to, to charm the establishment with the views that he has. I, I personally find it remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, Set Cavalier describes an evil which is made manifest through events and actions, but which is never defined or understood. Once there was harmony and order in the city, no longer. And uh, no, I've said that, that this force, and so we have the first reading of where the children, uh, the evil within the children breaks out. It's, it's quite a disturbing piece of, of writing. Um, my, Michael, would, would, um, from London, would you, would you be able, yeah, you've just done something in French, so let's see, yeah. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, Yeah. yeah. Okay. Once a year at Christmas, the Margrave gave a reception in the castle to the top pupils of all the classes in the city. A hundred children, aged between seven and thirteen, for a puppet show, followed by a sumptuous meal. That is how it all began at the time of that last Christmas. The children were installed in their usual places in the Mar. Margrave, as was the custom, made a short speech of welcome, which in contrast to all the previous years, was received with only sporadic applause. Then came the moment for the puppet show to begin. It was about a poor, clumsy, and unfortunate baron who was persecuted because he had dared to set eyes upon a beautiful and noble lady coveted by a powerful lord. In the second act, metamorphosis by a good fairy, he overcomes all obstacles, escapes from all the traps, confounds his enemies, and the Margrave consents to his marrying the beautiful lady who falls into his arms, accompanied by the benediction of, of the cardinal and the acclamation of the people. The costumes were superb, the movements of the characters carried out perfectly. The storyline was appropriately edifying and well-conceived. The dialogue, powerful, abounding with humor and good sense. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the, the performance fell flat. <clears throat> the young audience remained deadly still throughout. <clears throat> and any member of the audience who seemed to enjoy the show quickly ceased when they noticed how still their schoolmates were, as though something threatened them. When the curtain fell, uproar broke out. First of all, there were whistles, then insults were hurled and expletives. Stamping the feet on the chairs, the boys began to hurl obscenities which nobody had imagined could ever have uttered. The stage castle was attacked, smashed to pieces, reduced to a pile of planks and tissue by the enraged children. They took the puppets, removed the puppets' clothes, dismembered them, crushed them with their heels. After the entire puppet show had been destroyed, they attacked the buffet which had been laid out for them. A valet was hurled out of the window. The others escaped just in time. The guards had to be called. The boys leaped into the, onto the guards' shoulders and tried to gouge their eyes out with forks mm -hmm. and knives. They bit to the bone any hands that tried to restrain them. A sage Jewish doctor in the city spoke of subconscious significations of a conduct which cannot be explained in terms of consciousness. The transfer of the conflict and nervous symptoms due to an excess of suppression in the face of social and moral demands. And for the city, that is the event which heralds the beginning of the end. How does one so reactionary reconcile his Roman Catholic faith, uh, faith with the modern policies of the Church of Rome and Vatican II? Raspai's theological position predictably is uncompromising and consistent. It takes us back hundreds of years to the Great Schism. In L'Anneau du Pêcheur, the Fisher's Ring, which swings sometimes dizzily from present day to the 14th century and back again, half thriller and half historical treatise, 
Raspail makes his clearest statement of fundamentalist Roman Catholic faith. In the Great Schism, largely forgotten by Roman Catholics, let alone by anyone else, where there was at one time three popes, each pope condemning both other popes as <laughs> anti-popes, Raspail upholds the cause of the, in the eyes of the church today, anti-pope, Benedictine XIII, who was the Spaniard Petro Martinez de Luna and elected by conclave in Avignon to become Pope in 1394. And he was Pope from 1394 to 1417 or 1423, depending on which side you're on. Benedict insisted that he was the legitimate Pope against the claims of his two rivals on the grounds that he was the only living Cardinal created by Gregory XI, who was Pope from 1370 to 1378 and the last Pope before the schism. The Great Schism was officially ended by the Council of Constance in 1418, but for Raspail, that passionate champion of lost causes, uh, that is not acceptable because he disputes that council's legitimacy. His novel mixes the mystery of the past with the present. In the town of Rodez, in 1993, an old man arrives on foot he carries with him a scrip in which is laid the Fisher's Ring, emblem of the line of popes which can be traced back to Benedict XIII. Now this may well seem obscure and irrelevant to many readers, but Raspail is insisting on the necessity for loyalty to any cause, however obscure, however minority, to which a man has set his undying faith. There can be no compromise. It is a religious duty to hold to one's faith and what is legitimate in one's own eyes and that for a spy is worth everything. And material success at the expense of one's faith is diabolic moonshine. He wrote in Lille Bleu that convictions are but attitudes and in resting faithful to them, one has played a game, playing the game of your life. And if you have to, you play to lose. At which point it seems to me that Raspai comes very close to Nietzsche. Raspai is able as a writer to maintain a complete seriousness on the issues to which he is committed, while at the same time he's able to objectify himself, even relativize the importance of all human striving, as, as suggested in what I've just quoted, and even regard himself and his concerns with a certain humorous compassion, a remarkable and striking quality of the man and of the writer. Despite its great difference to Le Conte des Saints, in some respects, it resembles a thriller by Dan Brown. <laughs> Lano du Pecheur shares many characteristics, a passionate devotion to what, it, to what is right, despite all persecution and suffering, a refusal ever to be swayed by a majority belief, it being a fatal democratic error in Raspail's eyes that majorities should be deemed to carry any legitimacy whatsoever. An awareness of the significance and strength of symbols and gestures, a belief in the good, and hope somehow and and hope somehow and somewhere enduring and persisting. In Le Pont des Saints, a small group of paratroopers accepts the foredoomed assignment of offering armed resistance to the human tsunami of refugees. It is a gesture of faith in their race and their nation, in what they are as beings accountable to a divinity which shapes all our ends. Resistance is a religious act of faith and a redemption from failure and a redemption from sin. Similarly, in La Noé le Pêcheur, the symbol of the ring transferred from one generation to the next of those popes who for Raspail are legitimate is a pure act, a symbolic act, an act of fulfillment and grace. This symbolic and pure and purifying act or well, these symbolic and pure and purifying acts are the essence of Raspail's profound religious faith. In all his fictional works, two great forces are evident and described. The first is fate, invoked by sometimes occult, but nevertheless omnipotent natural laws, for example, the survival of the strongest, the fatal consequences of physical or spiritual weakness. And the second is resistance, which is trial, which is love placed upon the faithful, even to the point of sacrifice, agony and death. Martyrs are witnesses down through time to their truth. The last lines of Lanon du Pêcheur highlight the dry cynicism and a certain world weary humor, which cheerily accompanies Raspail's earnest faith. 
It is characteristic of Raspai, the Catholic, the royalist, the patriot, the explorer, the anthropologist, the man for whom tradition and spiritual commitments were living injunctions, not pious oaths alone, to, to never abandon humor. And I had to explain there is a kind of humor which Raspai recognizes. Um, I didn't uh, know this until a few years ago. Uh, quite a lot of the popes, uh, there are two popes with the same names. Maybe most people know that, I didn't know that. And uh, if a pope was particularly scandalous in the past, uh, it was approved by Rome to give a new pope the name. For example, uh, John the 23rd, who was known as a very holy man, uh, there was a John the 23rd who, who was quite appalling in the 14th century. So they uh, got another pope to be called John the 23rd. It's the same with Benedict the 13th, who is so revered by Raspai. Another Benedict the 13th was, um, became Pope in 1714 to sort of airbrush the, the other Benedict the 13th. So if you think you're going to learn the names of the popes, it's not only incredibly difficult because there are so many of them with the same names, but you also have to be aware that quite a lot of them, there are two Benedict the 13th, there are two John the 23rds and probably a few more like that. And in this reading, you can see Raspai is aware of this, the, the humor of that. Oh, well, thanks for that. For, for that. Um... Daniel, do you want to have a, have a go with with, with this? It's, it's... Uh, shall I read? Mm -hmm. um, any worshipper today finding his way among the Holy Vatican Rotos under the basilisk, among the tombs of the Pope? And a fair number of princes and fans too will probably not have his or her attention drawn by a modest sacrifice of marble rights of recent recent dates placed along the wall. Behind the tomb of Saint Christina of Sweden, uh, behind the tomb of Saint Christina of Sweden, a solitary inscription on the side Benedictus. The nearest neighbor is John. The uh, um, 30. 20, sorry. Not, uh, oh, yes, yes, sorry. Not Baldassar X Cosa, the Pope from Pisa, who was perhaps the real Pope with that name, but certainly a false Pope deposed by the Council of Constance, which he himself convoked, but Angelo Roncalli, Pope from the uh, 23rd. He, as it were, who was also unwise enough to convoke a council. It was called Vatican II and its origin. We can thank you. You see, so Raspai is not without humor towards his own views, which is also a, a, a very human and, and attractive quality, I think. Mm. He is, of course, best known for his hugely successful dystopian Le Con des Saints. Uh, published in 1973. In a television interview many years after it was published, Raspai called Le Con des Saints a parable. When we remember the parables of the Gospels, they are given as anecdotes with symbolic meaning from which we should learn. This is exactly what Le Con des Saints offers the reader. The story recounts with the concentrating, concentration and simple language of a thriller events unfolding after the West learns that an armada of famished refugees soon to be called the Last Hope Armada, is making its way to Europe. The non-white world has stood up and is tramping and sailing to the white homelands. Lacking spiritual robustness, lacking belief or any pride at all in itself, having lost its soul, the West, and with it the white race, succumbs to annihilation in this futuristic, or today how futuristic, novel. In 1973, when the book was published, the default censorious attitude embodied in tropes such as cancel culture, political incorrectness, and even racism, was still in their infancy. Le Con des Saints was translated into English and published by the prestigious Sphere Books. The book sold well and was enthusiastically reviewed by nationalist groups. There was an enthusiastic review in John Tyndall's Spearhead, for example. But this had been written by someone who was politically at least an unknown, a member of no party, a speaker on no political platform. 
Raspail recalled that he found inspiration for his parable, as he called it, when on the Mediterranean shores, he gazed across the water and simply asked himself, but what would happen if the mass of the non-white world just stood up in their millions and decided to come here? What would happen? Like the Alakulov, the Caucasian of the Comte des Saints is doomed to extinction. But unlike the Alakulov, the Caucasian cannot offer the excuse that physical resistance is futile. Far from it. The challenger to the white man's hegemony is not technically superior at all. And the invaders of Le Comte des Saints are unarmed. The pleading by armed forces that resistance is futile epitomizes what Raspice saw as the treachery of democratic elites. Many believe that Raspail was a prophet. Le Comte des Saints abounds with scenes which then seemed inventive, but today have become familiar, even mundane. The book brings together all the different strands of surrender which have become more evident now than they were then. But Raspail saw them all and depicted them all. They are all there. The treacherous, cowardly democratic politician embodied in the no alternative of Germany's simpering Angela Merkel. The waving of thousands of hands from approaching immigrant ships, and I really see pictures of that, and Raspai described those hands in the Condé mm. The appeal to international moral obligations, the call to embrace Christian values, the shibboleth, we are all brothers, the mantra, it's not their fault, he is my brother, the propaganda in the classroom, the refugees welcome campaign, the exploitation of the natural generosity of the young, the treacherous prelates pleading for empathy for the non-white, non-Christian, preaching a Christian duty to be good Samaritans to the humble and oppressed, the liberal school teacher, the pusillanimous compromisers, the subversive white-hating cleric, the violent anti-fascist, the businessman who strives to keep up with fashionable egalitarian ideas, while hypocritically marketing dreams of exclusive luxury, the humanist slogans demanding compassion and appealing to human rights. Raspai, with the sharp eye of the inquisitive explorer, sees them all, depicts them all. The mentality of the ashamed, self-doubting white has never been betrayed ever by anyone, in my opinion, with more vividness, more surety or accuracy. Writing in September 2015 in Le Figaro, André Berkhoff said that Le Comte des Saints has become a chronicle of current affairs. The English language edition included a statement made by the late President Boumedine of Algeria two years after the first publication of the book. Together, we may be able to see a new style of life which will make it possible to feed the over 7 billion people who will be living on the earth in the year 2000. At the time of writing, this review, February 2021, I first wrote this review some time ago, the world's population was 7.8 billion, probably gone up a bit since then. If not, no quantity of atomic bombs will be able to stem the human tidal wave, which will depart from the poorer quarters of the world and break into the relatively open spaces of the rich temperate zone in search of survival. In Raspai's novel, The Dam Breaks, the novel makes for compulsive, albeit not enjoyable reading, which is another reason I'm given too many quotations from it, apart from the fact that I thought everybody probably could easily have access to the book, which is not the case, but it is depressing. Uh, and it has many poignancies and unerring citations, all overshadowed with a disquieting premonition that this is the tale of every man, white man's tomorrow. When the refugees land, they realize that they can take more than just the south of France. They come in huge boats across the Mediterranean and land in the south of France. And there's a lot of discussion, but nothing is done and they all land. And then some of them realize that they don't have to just stay in the south of France. We've got a short quotation coming up. Right. Um... Oh, perhaps I'll, uh, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll read this. Um, the, the mob had developed a morale, a spirit of steel, a conquering spirit. The result was that more than three quarters of the horde, the strongest and most adventurous, decided not to stop, but to push, push on further still. 
Later, historians would turn this spontaneous migration into an epic, dubbed the winning of the North, a term we agree with, but only by comparison. One can't help thinking of the first panel of the diptych, the flight to the North, the pathetic exodus of the country's rightful owners, their self-willed downfall, their odious surrender. In the Philippines, in the all-stifling Third World ports Jakarta, Karachi, Konakri, and again in Kolkata, another huge um, armadas were ready to weigh anchor, bound for Australia, New Zealand, Europe, carpet-like. The Great Migration was beginning to unroll. Not for the first time either, if we pore over history. Many a civilization, victim of the same, self-same fate, sits tucked in our museums, under glass and neatly labelled. But man seldom learns from lessons of the past. And the author's very brief preface is chilling, and here it is in full. That's another reading, if you wish. Right. Uh, Mick, do you want to do, do this one if you're still there? Let's have a look. This is Russ by himself, it's short, uh, uh, very Mickey, short are you there? I know you, you occasionally have to tend to you. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, um, I had wanted to write a lengthy preface to explain my position and show that this is no while I dream. But even if the specific action, symbolic as it is, may seem far-fetched, the fact remains we are inevitably heading for something of the sort. We need only glance at the awesome population figures for the years from now. Seven billion people, only 900 million of whom will be white. But what good would it do? I should at least point out, however, that many of the texts I have put in my characters' mouths, or... Yeah. Or pens. Oh. Yeah, instead. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I've just... Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry it's my fault. Or pens, or pens. Come on, Mick. Mick? Come on, Mick. 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 Oh, pens, editorial speeches, pastoral letters, laws, news stories. Yeah? Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, so perhaps the reader will spot them as they go by. In terms of the fictional statement I have presented, they become all the more revealing. Okay, so that, that was Russ Bay's very brief uh, preface. The white world in Le Camp des Saints, having lost the will to maintain itself, firstly physically and secondly in its symbols, its traditions and ceremonies, including music and, and prayer, is propelled quite naturally into extinction. Prayer or the failure to pray plays a key role in Raspai's novels. Prayer is the expression of undying hope. The lost whites of Le Camp des Saints do not pray. All those who believe in themselves so Raspai pray in their hearts. Prayer is the grace-given expression of hope, and the inability to pray, or worse still, a rejection of prayer as superstition or no longer effective, is a sure sign that a group, a tribe, a religion, a race, a nation is standing before the abyss. The title of Le Corne des Saints is taken from the Bible in the book of Revelations 29, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. Raspai likes playing games with his readers. The citation from Comte des Saints is incomplete, of course, and the verse continues. Perhaps someone can complete the verse for me, see if we have any Bible readers here. They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city Ah. The rest of the Bible citation is, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And I, it's remarkable, <laughs> Raspai deliberately, for he certainly knew his Bible, uh, left the quotation incomplete so that hope is half hidden, but it is there. Thus the extreme darkness of the novel contains within it that thin ray of hope which Raspai himself conceals, and I see as successfully concealed from you, one of the ever-living three virtues, and according to legend, the last voice to be heard from Pandora's box. 
Mm. Raspail's funeral took place in the stately Eglise Saint Roche in the Rue Saint Honoré in Paris on the 16th of June 2020. Among other dignitaries attending was the Count of Paris, who is the heir presumptive to the French throne, mm. and the heir apparent to the Kingdom of Araucania and, pa and Patagonia. The coffin of the deceased was draped not in the French red, white and blue, not in the tricolor as would be customary at funerals of French dignitaries and celebrities. Behold, the coffin was bedecked in the very flag that Bertrand had hoisted in defiance of the German tanks, the flag which was planted futilely by Antoine de Tunen in South America over a hundred years previously, a flag of blue, white, and green horizontal stripes, the flag of the kingdom of Patagonia. Thank you. That was it. Michael, thank you for such a masterly tribute to a man of um, uh, fascinatingly um, profound and also equally uh, explosive ideas really uh, and i think you, you've handled them very sensitively not not an easy man to uh um uh to 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 describe in in a way that that, that, that gives gives uh um the honors his 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 breadth really i i no, i i, I, I an, an extraordinary man i i never knew really yeah i i mean it, 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 you, you brought him to to i'm sure not just my attention but but others and, and such, such such a range of of interests and with a, a well-developed philosophy it, it it seems um could could you say something about he, how his ideas impacted his writing style um i did did, did he his vocabulary for instance mm. uh did that i mean did he sounds as if he, he saw as someone who had definite ideas about a lot of things. Did he have a lot of ideas about French prose? Um, Ooh, uh, his perhaps. writing is um, rich. I mean, the vocabulary is rich. It wouldn't be if I were uh, teaching subword French. I wouldn't uh, produce his book as the first uh, example of French literature they should try to read. It's not excessively difficult, but it's not excessively easy. Um, and he's certainly very careful of his language and his prose. Um, but he doesn't go to the extremes of, uh, of say, someone like Celine indulging in slang for its own sake. Mm. There is some slang, but I mean, um, did, I'm not quite sure if I've understood your question. But. Does, does, does he use um, um, archaic um, grammatical forms or... Thing, uh, think, yes, th things which he feels ah, this this was a really good feature of French, the French <laughs> language, which no longer is being used, but it should be. So I'm going to use it. Not that I noticed. I did notice, however, that he uses that uh, correct French, which many people would consider archaic, such as the past subjunctive and things like that. Um, but no, I, I, I don't feel that in Raspai too much. No, but I, I'm no. not. I mean, I'm not a native French speaker, so I'm a bit hesitant mm. about. And I was more concentrating on what was happening than, than paying. But after your question, I'll look at it again and see if there's anything special about the, the style of, of writing. It's a very colorful writing. It's very depictive. There's, mm. you, can, you can understand that he was an explorer, uh, somebody who was fascinated by uh, what strikes the eye. Um, he likes yeah. depicting scenes, also very French in that very often there are party meals that he spends some time describing. There's a scene in, in Le Conde des Saints, which is almost considered a sort of symbol of French civilization, is when the old man, who is obviously Raspai himself, I think, at the, uh, who has a house overlooking the sea and sees this armada coming, and his guests are the few paratroopers who are actually going to shoot at the refugees, for which, of course, they will be then immediately destroyed by the French Air Force. Um, but uh, before this happens, he presents them with a wonderful meal. And uh, there's some description of this meal, and it's a, a sort of description of civilization for him, that the meal yeah, is yeah. properly prepared with the right glasses and everything, which is... Um, but uh, yet, no, I haven't given enough thought exactly to his, his style. Did, I mean, did, did he think that um, French culture 
uh, was uh, of its essence a culture of clarity and uh, a certain beauty of form. I know that some mm. artists and musicians have thought that that was a, a, an important thing, rather than um, becoming too emotionally engaged, uh, the, the, that perhaps they might regard as emotional indulgence uh, in, in, in the writing. Uh, obviously, I, I have difficulty answering that question, uh, to be honest with you, Stan, uh, but I certainly think that he was very conscious of the fact that different languages express things in different ways, mm. and that what he had to express was best expressed in French, because he, although he was a relativist, for him, France was, was first and in, in his life, and therefore that the French language, as far as he was concerned, could not be um, equaled by any other language, not in the sense that objectively, and this is a difficult point about mm. relativism, isn't it? I mean, this is the whole issue. Not that objectively it was in some way superior, but in one person's mm. life it's superior. Just as your own mother is more important to you as a mother than anybody else's yeah, mother, yeah. whereas you wouldn't pretend that objectively, you know, she said, you say you, she's the best mum in the world. You don't mm. really mean that objectively, scientifically, you can prove that you she was a better mother than someone else's. It sampled the motherings. And yeah, so other I, I think I would yeah. guess, yeah. I would, my hunch would be that is how Raspai regarded the French language. Yeah. Um, and certainly indulged in it and used it very well. I mean, he was a very fine writer indeed. Mm, mm, mm. So I'm, I'm monopolizing. Uh, anyone else would like to make some? Can I ask Michael, um, I expect I could find this out myself, but are any of the books apart from Camp of the Saints available in English? Uh, yes, I'm not quite sure myself. And uh, the, you might need to distinguish between what's available now and yes. what was available, I mean, the Camp of the Saints would be immediately a case of that. I'm pretty sure that the Seven, uh, Seven Horsemen was translated, the mm. Set Chevalier. You'd That's have to seven. research I see. Yeah, the Seven Horsemen. If you look in the internet and see yes. uh, Jean Raspai writer or Wikipedia yeah. and, and use the English one, they'll almost certainly give you the English titles. Oh, right, okay. But I would stress, uh, Robin, there's a difference between what was available <laughs> yes. and what has now become available. I have the impression that in the English-speaking world, there's been, don't I hesitate to use the word conspiracy, but let's say some efforts to ensure that Raspai is not. Well, there uh, are, sev there are several trip. second-hand uh, um, yeah. on the internet. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I would, a, yeah. Abe books, I mean, I yeah. try to avoid Amazon if I possibly can, but yeah. Abe, uh, Alibris and Amazon are, the, yeah. are the three I know of, which I, uh, all of which I use from time to time. Mm. My other question is, um, you've given a very good um, talk, which I think you said to be published before or prepared before. Is it in print anywhere, which we can... Well, uh, not in print. It is based on, although I have changed it a bit, it's based on a review I, vote, uh, I wrote for Countercurrent. <laughs> Robin, I can always, I mean, I, I've got the text Michael has, we can send yeah. it to you, it's not... Uh, that would be good, because it's, it reflects... Yeah, but that's a general point, actually, that Robin's brought up. If anybody wants any of these texts, mm. I always send the text to, to mm. Stead, or you can ask me directly. They might have a few misprints and things, but if you can tolerate mm. that. I, Michael York from York asked me for the Richard the Second and only found one serious typo, which surprised me, but uh, allowing for the sort of serious typos that will be there. Yeah, I'm quite happy that I'm not mm. claiming, uh, I don't want to keep it for myself. I'm, I'm flattered if anybody wants to see the text. And, and well, it, well. It, it repairs uh, a reading again and, and thinking about and perhaps yeah. to, uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, to find I, some I, of these references. Uh, which, I, uh, I, I agree, yeah. yeah, yes, indeed. I, I, I'd second that. I, 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 you know, to my- I feel I've got to go now, but thanks. Oh, very okay, much. Yeah, thanks okay, a lot. Bye-bye, uh, Michael. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank, thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks for coming. I I um didn't know. I I hadn't heard of the um a la, a la Kalufs, uh, if that's no, right. nor had I until you I know, read John Rush's book. Yeah. Mm. My, Michael, I mean, you're from America. Had, had you heard of this ethnic group? Uh, no. No. I mean, yeah. um, is 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 that is that really the the case? That I mean, uh, uh, Mark, Michael in 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 Germany, that that they were um, resident in most of North America, and, and I, I, I would imagine it's the case. I haven't checked, yeah. I haven't researched it. I would be surprised if uh, Jean Raspail would create a fiction about that. Yeah, no, no. It, um, it, it, although, of course, as I've as I mentioned in my talk, there is this mixture of, yes. <laughs> of things, so one has to be careful. 
I mean, uh, one does know that, of course, uh, whatever you want to call them, Native Americans or Red Indians or whatever the new word is, mm. um, were not native uh, so very long. They came yeah, over they came across the Bering, Bering Strait, 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 I think, quite, apparently. Quite obviously yeah. Asian, spoke Asian yeah. languages and were uh. Asian it, well, invaders if there were any other human beings there, but it seems likely that there were given the stage of human civilization. So I have no real reason to dispute mm. what Raspai said. It is, and it's very, very sad the way he they're very peaceful and, and rather stupid. I mean, he doesn't hide that. This is the other thing. He doesn't want to get sentimental. Raspai yeah. said, yeah, you know, they got, they're primitive. They got, you know, but they, they, you wouldn't do this to animals. Why would you do it to them? Yeah. This is sort of yeah. Raspai's point of view. And he said, but they've got no chance against these Indians and they keep moving south. <laughs> and, just, and then there's a horrible one in which uh, they, they think they're all right. And at times, it's long distances in this novel. And he's after about 200 years though, and it, there's just a second in the book, which, of course, from the point of view of anthropology and human history, is entirely correct. And uh, it, it just so it's like a second in the book, another 200 years, um, which is no time at all. Uh, I think it's a, a, a boy, I'm not quite sure, but it's a child who's covered in blood, rushes and says mm. that they can, hard, they can hardly articulate. But in their very primitive language makes it clear that the other group has been massacred by the old enemy, which is again moving mm. south. And again, they have to pick up and move south and south. Yeah. Mm. And, and do, they, do they still exist somewhere then? In, they in do, this? yes. And in fact, that I did check and they, 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 there are a few there and they're mm. in pretty miserable condition. Um, mm. uh, in his book, Raspai also describes, which is probably historically correct, how two were taken to France and put on show. Mm. And Raspai's disgust is very clear and very genuine. I'm here. Whew. And uh, what I think is probably fictional is that the, the showmaster who puts them on show as sort of animals, uh, that they break out of the cage where they've been and just tear him to pieces. Uh, that is probably fictional, but I think this is a sort of wish from Raspai yeah, because yeah. he really says, yeah, and he was torn bits of his limb. <laughs> it's obviously the one time where Raspai really becomes angry. And, and I say I've only read eight of his novels and I think he wrote well, that sounds 15 quite, uh, or quite 16 of them, not or yeah. more. He wrote about 20 novels, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's, of course, the whole interesting issue, I think, in Raspai of, of racism. Uh, what is racism? It's a word that's banded and thrown about, you know, ah, you're a racist. No, I'm not a racist. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. It's You're, you're only saying that without yeah. anybody defining what on earth it's supposed to mean. Uh, and uh, Raspai, of course, poses the question, is Raspai a racist? Because on the one hand, he definitely believed in superior intelligence of races and so on. And on the other hand, he's entirely sympathetic to the underdog. Uh, you could say that's extremely racist or extremely not, but it's, uh, it's certainly he raises that question in its most mm. extreme form. I, I, I definitely try and avoid the word. I don't think it's a, just it, yeah. it, it, it's a fatal word, but yeah, of course it, it it's a word that it. inevitably comes up. And if you yeah, read, I mean, hostile notices about him, that word will in, inevitably mm. be used. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what was his relationship? I mean, to 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 to, to the crowns, you know, to countries where where there is a monarchy. I mean, was he pro British in respect to the? Uh, he was. Yes, I think. Uh, despite the uh, opposition to Britain's claim on the Falklands Islands, I think he was uh, somewhat pro British in the same way that Driula or Rochelle was pro British. Uh, an admiration for the style and the tradition that he believed had been upheld in many respects more in Britain than in France, and the continuation, at least, of the monarchy. Yeah. And uh, in fact, he did say in some interview or something, he was uh, watching television, which is, of course, another modernist thing. I mean, he was quite a, obviously, he did compromise with the modern mm. world. He wasn't Amish. Um, but he said it was an interview with Prince Charles, and he said that Prince Charles said that the monarchy was not just about practical government or was it better to have a monarchy or a democracy, but monarchy was a, had a spiritual symbolism. And mm -hmm. Raspai said at that point he was alone watching the television, but he stood up and saluted Prince Charles, oh, having good. understood the, 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 the meaning or the necessity of monarchy. That's interesting. Yeah. No, no that yeah. is interesting. I, I, I thought it might have appealed to him also that... Uh, Britain is, I think, um, uh, um, 
only uh, uh, only similar in this respect to Denmark that that has has the the, the, the head of state also the head of the national church that might mm. uh, you know appeal, appeal to him but, uh, um, what what um yeah I mean what 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 sort of writers do you know he admired or, or thinkers or, mm. or that's a good question I I can't uh, uh oh well yes now wait a minute. Uh, in uh, Les Sept Cavaliers, uh, uh, very surprisingly, you mentioned that, um, they read some poetry or quote some poetry, and it's a poetry by Apollinaire. So mm. that, that's the only one spontaneously occurs to me. Yeah. I mean, did he see himself as, as in a tradition of Catholic writers? Uh, I mean, the, the people like Chesterton, or obviously that, I'm familiar with that movement in in Britain, but I'm sure it was equally strong in in America. Sorry, in in France, that of people that are pro pro monarchy and and run Catholic. Is he, he identified with that? I, I I don't think he did, and in fact, it's a, it's a, a feature of his writing that it seems to be very um, can one say autar autarchical? I mean, a very independent of, of yeah yeah at least of other conscious influences. I mean, with your question, which I had thought of it before, Apollinaire is the only one I immediately think of. Yeah. There seems to be no quotations, no sort of obvious references to other writers, and he certainly had nothing to do with uh, what Charles was that? Moras or whatever. No, Ch yeah, exactly, Charles Moras, or still less, uh, Francois Mauriac, um, probably would have horrified him. And um, uh, Claude Marcel, is it that very, very sort of extreme uh, Catholic writer? He didn't seem to have any any association with those Peguy, but I, not that I know. But I, I'm not an expert on French literature, and uh, I've read his, some of his novels, but um, they're valid questions. I feel slightly weak because I'm not really in a position to answer with authority. What, what was his view on the classical heritage of Europe? Uh, Homer, uh, Virgil, and so forth. The, and the classical, a, you mean the classical, yeah. Yeah, major part of French culture still, isn't it? You know, compared to, to I think, our uh, our culture here. But I, again, I'm trying to think. I can't see. I would say probably his religious faith, his Christian Catholic faith was so strong that he didn't... Well, I'm going to say he didn't. I'm not going to I'm, be careful here. I don't know. Um, the Saint Cavalier does have pagan images in it. It's probably the most pagan of his books. Yeah. Uh, because Le Sept Cavalier has, seems to have no Christian religious reference. And actually, it's interesting you're answering these questions because I hadn't thought of them until you asked me. Uh, but oh, you know, it, now that yeah. I think about it, Le Sept Cavalier has almost a sort of Tolkien atmosphere about it. And yeah, that's interesting. I'm yeah, just trying yeah. to think. I, I suppose there are, I think there's a bishop or something, but it's very low key. Mm. Whereas his mm. other novels are full of Catholic symbolism, I would say. I mean, Le Conte des Saints, this, this, uh, is it this dwarf sitting on the large giant, which is full of sort of biblical imagery of the giants? Mm -hmm. and, um, and obviously, the Pêcheur, uh, Roi des Pêcheurs, obviously completely Christian. Um, so, yes, I, I, I didn't see it very strongly, no. I mean, um, by, by his, uh, uh, um, by the importance for him of a particular lineage of popes, he, he, he does seem to be much more of that camp uh, that I alluded to at the last bloke that Hilaire Belloc saw himself as part of, that he believed uh, in Jesus, because the church told him to almost, he believed in the church, it seemed to me, as, a, as an institution of its, you know, uh, uh, that had its own legitimacy, irrespective of its doctrines in some sense. Yeah, I, I think what is... I find especially, yes, sympathetic about him, or where I even associate with Raspai, is that it's not so much that he, he regards something or a new postulate or a new dogma, is it right or wrong, it says, is it in accordance with my tradition? And if somebody suddenly says this is right or wrong from nowhere, uh, you've got to accept some kind of a new reality. Raspai said, no, this is outrageous. If I've lived so many years of my life or I've been brought up with something, there has to be an enormous, overwhelming argument and, and persuasiveness mm -hmm. to make me change one iota from what I have always been. And of course, the modern world is full of expecting people to completely change their views and 
attitudes. I mean, if you just take the subject of homosexuality as just an example, almost the same journalists who would have in 1950 said, yeah, a life sentence is fine and people are mentally sick will be saying yeah. in, in within 30 years, <laughs> yes. you're mentally sick if you think they're mentally sick. Yes, 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 yeah, well, yes It's yes, not yes, a question yes, of whether right yes. or wrong, but you can't, how can human beings, I don't know if I would say, do you stay with what you believe? Almost, he's almost saying, even if it's wrong, better than just to be a turncoat because you're afraid of having a different opinion from everyone else. Mm. And there's, in fact, one thing, which genre spy actually honors the enemy with courage, if you like. There, in the one scene, it, it, he said, it's all a disgrace what happens in uh, Le Conde des Saints and uh, especially the, the entire left. He says there's only one moment when, he, when they achieve something human. And that paradoxically is when there are a couple of leftists who are so disgusted by what's by paratroopers saying they're gonna shoot the refugees that they go down and have a confrontation. And one of them manages to get a Molotov cocktail and <laughs> throws it at the tank of one of these recalcitrant soldiers who are going to fight the refugees. And, Re and Jean Respai's comment is in that one moment he was a, a human. Mm -hmm. Whoa, I mean, that's really strong stuff, you know. Um, possibly uh, San Lu, the French writer San Lu had something like that. Uh, if you've read his novels at all, it was a pseudonym, I can't remember his original name. But San Lu wrote uh, a number of novels which also included one where there's a scene where it's the old right-wing father and he has a problem with his son who's, uh, who's harboring um, people who are sympathetic to the National Liberation Army of Algeria. And he says to his son, I know that you're harboring this person. And son sort of looks of ace. He said, don't look away from me. He said, if you're my son, look me in the eyes and tell me. And uh, the boy looks up and he says yes i'm harboring him because i believe in the freedom of the people of algeria and you're a reactionary and my fa the father says thank god you're my son <laughs> thank god you're my son you know it's admir so uh, I, I think that was very strong in raspai is to admire almost anybody who yeah is not doing something because of their career their ambition or because they're afraid of what other people think or what's, what's expected of them from a, a, a sort of cowardly society, but what they expect from themselves, from their own duty. And I, I, I would say famous is what you call authenticity. Yeah, yeah. And that link to authenticity perhaps links Jean Raspail to a certain sort of inverted commas left-wing current in French literature, you know, be authentic, find yourself, you know. Ah, it's a, it's an interesting. Uh, Point. Was, was, it, was, it, was he married? Did he have a... a... Yes, he was married and he had, uh, I think, two children. I, I, um, I'm sorry. I, I, sorry. Two children, I think he had. Yeah. I, I imagine he, he would be someone that, that liked animals somehow, you know, would have... Oh, certainly he did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Although they don't play... I obviously admired horses and there's a lot of description yeah, of horses. Yeah, yeah. Um... And did he, was he, I mean, did he regularly attend church, you know, or? or... I would imagine he did, yes. Or I, 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 was... I would, although, was he so extreme? That he exactly. Was... <laughs> there were these people that nothing is good enough for. I mean, not that, he, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, I can't answer your question. Um, I, uh... I, no, I don't know is the answer to that. I mean, is he it... wasn't so, don't, don't, I mean, he appeared. In fact, it was the first time that I even heard of him was he appeared at a Gress conference uh, at the time of the publication of his book, in fact, to sign copies. Mm. So there was a certain mutual tolerance there. I mean, Gress didn't mind having this ultramontane Catholic, and he obviously didn't mind appearing. Yes. Um, yes. But no, I don't know if he went regularly to Mass. If he I did, mean, it must have been that, that Mass where Le Pen used to go. I can't remember where it is. That that church um, in Paris, very elaborate. I um, can't remember where it is. I can see it, but it's in that square. Presumably, Never yeah, mind. he'd have been a, a, a he'd, he'd have preferred the use of Latin or something. Or oh, something definitely, like yeah, no yeah, question which, of that. Yeah, which yeah. I, I, I've recently discovered um, the current pope has, has, has placed restrictions upon, um, and if if priests want to use uh, a Latin mass, they have to get special permission from. Yeah, so I, I I read about that. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. and and uh, the bishop has to ascertain whether or not there there are any political motives in people wishing to use Latin. Just, Seems yeah. quite interesting, but anyway, um, um, oh, what was it going to say? 
What was I going to say? Um, oh, we're just just three of us here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. What was his relationship with Gress? And I, I mean, uh, he it seemed to have been a very good one, at least. Uh, when I say his relationship with Gress, I, I I did mention, and it's true, he was not at all uh, somebody who liked to speak on public platforms or yeah, yeah. make a name for himself, which me means, in my opinion, is his achievement is all the more remarkable because not only were his opinions completely out of kilter with the opinions of the, even in those days of the um, established political mm -hmm. parties, the establishment. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, he didn't indulge in the kind of social climbing that, you know, to meeting the right people, going to the right dinners, uh, saying the right friendly things to the right people. I don't think he yeah. did that very much either. And it was uh, Gress invited him. I don't think in any way it was, you know, he tried to get invited. I don't think mm, so. Mm, mm. And after one appearance, I don't think he went to any more of their conferences, but they, they, he was often mentioned at Gress meetings. I do remember that with sort of, with respect mm, and mm. admiration. Yeah, yes, he, 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 he comes across as, as being a, uh, a man of some nobility. In, in, you know, in, in his... Yeah. Well, of course, he, 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 it 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 um, dovetailed per uh, perfectly with the emphasis that Gress put on the time at the time, and uh, also the appearance of Fai's book, which is more or less, I think, the same time as Raspail's, mm -hmm. which was uh, Le Système à tuer les peuples. And mm -hmm. Le Système à tuer les peuples was also about it was very much this idea of the rights of peoples, and Gress was at that time stressing its belief that globalism threatened the identity of different peoples uh, and uh, there was this sort of solidarity that they expressed with other peoples and yeah i think it was within their conference and they do they put i think it was actually that conference that they invited Raspai. i don't know if he spoke i wasn't there i don't think he even spoke i think he was just there to sign his book mm, mm, mm. Right, um, in, in, interesting uh um you you, you 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 never met him, Mick. You you seem to have met met a lot of people. Oh, no, no, uh, no, no. I didn't meet Yeah, I think it was a person that may, most people didn't meet. I mean, he yes, was, yes. wasn't a very sociable person. Yeah, now, he wasn't antisocial. He wasn't unfriendly. He, but as he, I say, you know, most successful writers. Oh, good, good. I'll go to that. Get free dinner. Oh, well, I can meet those people. He wasn't like that. Yeah, yeah. Did he did he enjoy sports? Or do you know? Was it? But yes, uh, uh, particularly sailing. It was a great sailor. Perhaps I should have stressed that he was very very keen on the navy, on the marines. He had huge he had collections season, yeah. of model ships. Oh, that's right. Uh, yes, yes, yes. In the photograph. Yes, yes. Indeed. Yeah, and um, Les Yeux d'Irene. A lot of it takes place on a boat. What happens? It's all sea time. Yeah. I suspect. I don't know that he's. If he's not got Norman roots, or you might have Breton roots, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just guessing there. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, that and I think horse riding, show jumping. Perhaps he did something of like that, and uh, kayaking, canoeing, and uh, he liked cars, but vintage cars and drove yeah, in, yeah. in Les Yeux d'Irene. He drives his. I think it's an old Rolls. I can't remember. Oh, they, they are very, so very beautiful fast. vintage. Yeah, cars. yeah. Carefully trying to avoid the motorways, and when he yeah, comes yeah. to this motorway, it's described as 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 like a river of filth. <laughs> <laughs> and he and this girl just look at what he describes as this river of filth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very uh, far from those sort of progressive, futuristic right wingers who think you know it's all hunky dory and wonderful you know our country will be great with this and that um yeah you don't see that in him at all no no uh oh well yeah he seems someone that definitely to to try to um uh source some 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 quotes for for, for various events mm. for mm. you know a, a good spirit to keep our relationship with even though he's not, not, not yeah and as i say there is uh, another strange facet i i would say of him is that although he seems and is in a way to be extremely pessimistic there is some kind of underlying element which must come from his faith or something yeah, yeah. that somehow that pessimism and that uh, complete not exactly defeatism but complete pessimism 
doesn't have the effect that you might expect that such pessimism to have on you. At least that's my experience. We must have faith. We must have faith. You know, somehow Always. there's like that thing. And I, I notice um, it with the quotation yeah. because I um, I'm half better than everyone here. I sort of felt that was a chopped quotation, but I couldn't fulfill it. Um, but I absolutely knew, wait a minute, there's something quite dramatic after that. And then I checked in the Bible and yeah, <laughs> the next line is, you know, they're all destroyed, all these invaders. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, the, the um, Kali Lit Yuga will end at some point, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, perhaps the last point, but for anybody definitely of a strongly pagan disposition, uh, the seven riders the seven horsemen however you want to translate it you could translate the seven knights uh Le Set Chevalier is the book i would recommend because it is i would say the most pagan at least of the ones that i've read there seems to be a pagan atmosphere about it mm -hmm. um good well no that was that, that was wonderful Emma. yeah i mean it obviously you, you don't done quite a lot of work for the counter counts so yeah. it, it, it was relatively uh I shortened it because my counter current thing was a bit longer. Um, oh, really? Yeah, 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 right. yeah. No, 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 it was good. It was good, 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 good reading. So, no, I, th thanks, thanks, thanks very, very much. It's a shame not more people came. For absolutely. A, a well known absolutely. name. I would have thought that would have, I mean, I put some stuff on my Facebook page. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, absolutely. But there you are. That's, uh, yeah. It's strange. And, yeah, it's, I'm very pleased that Michael was able to come along, even mm. though. His, you know, his, his position is slightly different from from, from some of our. But, uh, uh, great, one wonderful. All right then. Um, yeah, uh, I hope to see everyone next next Sunday. We we should have uh, Rick, Ricardo uh, talking about um, Western civilization. Quite a good topic after this yes. afternoon. Yes, no, right. You yeah. know, let's yeah. hope he. Uh, I, I I I still quite I don't quite know why at two p.m. works for him if he's in Canada. But anyway, I mean that that's what he said. So maybe he's not in Canada. But, 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 well, two p.m. isn't too late if you're in Canada, is it? Um, sorry, I mean, it depends. If he's on the uh, east coast, it's six hours yeah, it's... different. So it's <laughs> well, it's quite. I said nine o'clock. It's quite early to start, isn't it? So yeah, why why wouldn't it work for him to to to, to be in the evening? Oh, oh, I don't know. OK, you yeah, see, because yeah. I suggested yeah, during yeah. the week. So, I mean, my, my, you know, I said, well, I can change it for time if you want to. So I don't know. Oh, well, maybe he's a morning person. He gets mm. up very early mm. or something. Yeah. But uh, oh, well, then okay. really I'll tell you one it. last question. Nothing yeah. to do with Raspai said, uh, how is that that very large American professor? Is he all right? Because he was health wise, not 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 at the top. Oh, um, AJ. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I think he's fine. I mean, we, we, oh, okay. we, we, we were in, in, in contact uh, because some of his research students have got an interesting topic about Nyal Saga that they can have a mute on. Yeah, he seems fine, mm -hmm. you know, which, 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 which is good, you know. Um, um, excellent. Um, I, oh, I don't think there's anything, um, anything, no, I don't think there's any, anything off, offhand, no. Oh, I, 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 yeah, I, I have a good week, um, yeah, thank and you. I, I'll see you next Sunday, I hope. Hope uh, to see you next about, Sunday, About 10 to 2. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cheers. Thanks, Bye-bye. Bye, Mike. Bye. Bye. Bye.